The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of Your Included, theologian Dr. Andrew Root explores how relationships play a central role in youth ministry. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. We have a lot to talk about. Youth ministry is a dynamic area, and you've got some challenging things to say that are significant for mm. facing what the church is up against in today's world. I wanted to read from Revisiting Relational Youth Ministry, your first book. Ministry, then, is not about using relationships to get individuals to accept a third thing, whether that be conservative politics, moral behaviors, or even the gospel message. Rather, ministry is about connection, one to another, about sharing in suffering and joy, about persons meeting persons with no pretense or secret motives. What ex are you driving at here? Yeah, I mean, the, again, the whole book, as you mentioned, really revolves around um, that point. And that point was really born um, in my own experience. And it was actually right around this area um, in a church here in Southern California that I was invited to be part of a, uh, of a youth ministry. It was at a large Presbyterian church, kind of a classic youth ministry. Um, and one Wednesday night, for no particular reason, some kids from the neighborhood that surrounded the church showed up on the church steps. And the church saw this as uh, serendipitous and a wonderful opportunity. So not really knowing what to do or how to do ministry with these young people, they decided um, to throw money at the problem, um, which probably happens too often in churches. Um, and I was the benefactor of that. It became my job. I was hired to actually bridge these two worlds between um, the kind of classic youth ministry and the church kids and then the kids in the neighborhood. Now, I was invited to be part of this and to take this job because I had worked for Young Life and um, supposedly knew what I was doing when it came to building relationships with, with young people. And it really took um, myself and the team of people I worked with about two or three weeks to realize we had no idea what we were doing. Mm. Now, we had been taught and we had read all sorts of youth ministry literature and we had done a lot of youth ministry and we were some of the best, smartest, good-looking youth workers that we knew about. Um, and it took us, again, like two weeks to realize we had no clue what we were doing. Now, like I said, we had been taught that all you had to do is try to be friends with these kids and that kids wanted relationships with adults and that through your relationship with the young person that you could lead them um, into the church or to accept Jesus or to um, avoid um, immoral behavior or that there would be a way that you could use your relationship to get young people um, somewhere positive, somewhere good. Well, the kids that we were working with that showed up on the church steps this night were not so easy to influence. And they had this incredibly genius way that was slightly diabolical of keeping adults at a distance. So we would get close to them and they had a way of either questioning our sexuality or questioning our motives or um, assuming that we were, would make a scene that we were going to do something to them. And it became really difficult to figure out how do you do ministry you know, we'd been told that all you had to do is build relationships with kids and they would come and these kids were pushing us away and I would go and visit these kids uh, at their public school campus and literally kids that I had known for months and had they had spent time at our church I would come up to them and they would literally say get the F away from me um, and swear in, in our face and this was not the kind of youth ministry I was Ooh. taught was supposed to happen these kids were supposed to want to be with me so I started to question, how do you actually go about doing this? You know, how do you, you take a kid, kid out for a Coke and um, a burger and you drive them home um, into, into their neighborhood and the fog that's condensed on your windows, they actually, right before you drop them off, write rival gang signs on it. So when you turn around and drive back through their neighborhood, your life is put in danger. I mean, how are you supposed to do ministry with a group of kids like this? And how are you supposed to do it when they seem to refuse your ministry but nevertheless continue to ask for it by showing up every week and showing up at 4 o'clock for something that starts at 7 and stay till 11.30 or 12. Well, it was actually in the middle of a fight with my wife that I realized that I had problems. Um, and I realized I had problems in more ways than one, but particularly I had problems in my conception of ministry. Now, we were newly married, and my wife was going through a crisis in her family of origin. 
that was really difficult for her as she tried to kind of get, figure out what was going on and who she was in the midst of this family chaos. And we'd spend a lot of nights just talking about issues and she would talk about how hard this was as her family was in the midst of transition. And I always had this great way of reframing her problem for her. Mm -hmm. So she would say things like, you know, this is really hard. And I said, well, you know, don't think about it like that. What if we think about it like this? Or she'd say, you know, I hate when this happens and I feel it just grieves me that this is all changed. Well, well, well we, you know, there are futures before us. We don't have to worry about this. Let's, let's just move on. We, you know, let's, let's think about something better than this. Well, finally, after me reframing all of her issues, she finally stopped me and said, would you just seriously just <laughs> stop? And she said these words, she said, don't you know, in her frustration, she said, don't you know that relationships are not about fixing things? Would you stop trying to fix me and just be with me? And if you can't be with me, nothing will get better anyhow. So stop trying to fix my problems and just be with me. And I realized when she said that, not only um, did I have a lot to learn about being <laughs> a young husband, but I also realized that that's exactly what I was doing in my ministry. And these kids who kind of lacked the middle class decorum that the kids had when I worked in suburban um, Minnesota, um, suburban St. Paul, uh, they, they lacked that. So they could simply just say, get away from me. Uh, but they knew that I had an agenda for the relationship. And maybe it was a good agenda. Maybe it was actually good for them. But my ministry wasn't essentially about them. It was about where I could take them. And maybe some of the things were really good, keeping them in church, um, helping them to understand who Jesus Christ is, those are all great things, but they had the sense that it was happening um, outside of our actual real relationship. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the third thing. That's something that I, I've taken from Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, in his first book, Sanctorum Communo. He has this beautiful phrase where he says, um, when we encounter the neighbor, God is there. And he says, there's not a third thing. There's no third thing. There's just me and you, or I and thou. And Jesus Christ becomes present there, um, not outside of that. And I think so often in youth ministry, the objective has been to use our relationship um, with young people to get to some third thing. And so what I try to do in the book is just reimagine what it would be to think about ministry, and it's really all ministry, not just youth ministry, but to think about ministry in this idea that there's no third thing, that somewhere in the midst of really encountering another person, God becomes concretely present within that. Isn't that true in any relationship mm -hmm. even? Uh, d it, as a church, isn't that how we tend to think uh, almost about all of our relationships outside the church, that it's a, a means to an end. We mm -hmm. get to know people, we draw them into the, into the sphere of the church in some way, through some project mm -hmm. or whatever, but, our, but we really have an, a hidden agenda. We have a, a, an ulterior motive, right. a good motive perhaps, of presenting the gospel to them, uh, but nonetheless, it's an ulterior motive. The friendship is for that sake, mm -hmm. almost like a mm -hmm. uh, insurance salesman approach or something, rather than friendship, relationship being an end in itself. Is there something to be said for that in terms of who Christ is in us and in them? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that is true. I mean, at, at one level, and I'll often, when I go around the the world and the country talking about this, you'll have people say, well, we always have agendas. I mean, you can't kind of strip yourself from an agenda. And that's okay. true. I mean, we are kind of located, socially located, and we have our own hermeneutical location that we take into relationships. But I think there is a difference, and I think you're, you're hitting on it. Um, and this reminds me of what the American sociologist Peter Berger talks about. And Peter Berger talks about that somewhere after industrialization and into mo a modernization, that we as people started to take what he calls technical rationality into the way we formulated um, and constructed our day-to-day -day relationships. So we spent so, many t so much time working in um, institutions that tend to make decisions on people um, through their bureaucracy and in very technical forms. For instance, I grew up in a, a community that um, 3M, a lot of employees from 3M um, lived. So 3M, the people who make your post-it notes and your tape. Mm -hmm. um, in one year, uh, 3M decided that they could actually save a lot of money if they laid people off who were over 55 and hired people at entry level. That they would lose very little productivity, but actually 
gain a lot, um, a lot of surplus in money. So a lot of people in, in a little neighborhood that, or in the little uh, suburb that I grew up in, they, they were laid off during this period. So a lot of my friends' parents were. And of course, 3M is making that decision. Not necessarily, they don't necessarily care about the people, but they care about, the, they make that decision technically. In, in the kind of realm of technical rationality, it makes sense for them, for their ultimate goal, which is the bottom line of making money, to lay people off who are over, over 55. So Berger's point is that those, that we live in those realities for so long that they start to filter into how we organize the rest of our relationships. So we start to say things like, honey, I still really do love you, but for the bottom line of my happiness, this marriage really isn't working out. Or we look at our friendships and say, well, I really do care about this person, we share this history, but I just can't do this relationship anymore because it's not letting me become the self-fulfilled person. And I think that's really filtered into the church as well, that we tend to make decisions about ministry um, by techni in technical realm. Um, we tend to use technical rationality to make decisions about how we go about doing ministry, um, how we think about the ministry of God. And I do think that there's a different logic um, than this technical rationality that we often fall into when we think about ministry. And that's, it, that's exactly the opposite of what uh, uh, real Christian life, mm -hmm. Christian ministry is all about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the core theological element that I'm working from um, in the book is this Trinitarian element that God the Father and Jesus the Son are in eternal relationship with each other. And that relationship isn't built around these kind of technical, technical rationality, but it's really built in the whole desire to be with and for each other. Um, and if you follow, if you look at um, Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics 1.1, he'll talk about the Spirit as the very, um, the very essence, the very reality of the Father and the Son's relationship. And I think too often in the church, we use our relationships as these means to another end, as opposed to seeing our relationships as a way of living into this inner reality of a relationship that's going on between the God the Father and God the Son that we're invited into through the Spirit. And so that's the element that I'm trying to, to work out in, in that sense of what if our relationships in ministry, um, in kind of a broken metaphor for sure, um, but in a metaphor reflect this eternal relationship that's going on between the Father and between the Son. You've used the term uh, a real relational, mm -hmm. relational yeah, yeah. youth ministry. And is that what you're... Yeah, I mean, I would put the, the relational element. I mean, there was an article that was written, oh, probably five or six years ago now that was trying to talk about a post-relational youth ministry. And I think it was a fair article that was trying to show some of the pitfalls of relational ministry. But I tried to reframe that and make the argument that we hadn't really talked about a truly relational, relational ministry, that our relationships in relational ministry had tended to be means to another end. They'd been um, for influence, to influence kids in some direction. And they've yet to actually reflect, um, maybe in this broken way, but in a real way, reflect the inner life of God that we're called um, into, this, this eternal relationship that goes on between the Father um, and the Son that we're invited into through the Spirit. There are a couple of ways I wanted to, to mm -hmm. go right now. One is to take uh, a different year sure. and talk about uh, your assessment of of the TV show Lost, but let's save that for a moment <laughs> okay. and uh, and get back to this uh, these young people you were working with and mm -hmm. you, you saw that you had to do things differently. Mm -hmm. So what what started to happen then? Um, we tried to live this out, but as you mentioned earlier, that it's really hard in a congregation and um, you run into all these conflicts. And it was very interesting to watch this church wrestle with this issue. So this. To the church's credit, they had raised money, they had seen this opportunity to do ministry with these young people from their neighborhood. They had hired me, um, and we worked really hard at it. And they s started this ministry in the full blessing of the church, that we really want to reach out to these kids, we really want to build relationships with them. Um, but of course what happened it, is it, it started to become very costly, and it became costly um, in ways that a lot of churches experience, but in very profound ways when you're experiencing them, like your building being tagged, like um, mothers who are waiting to pick up their daughters um, from church are noticing kids from the neighborhood um, doing things behind the church building that uh, would make anyone uncomfortable when drugs are being sold um, before Wednesday night program. And quickly the church's mantra changed from, we want to do ministry to these kids, that these kids need 
um, to act better, they don't deserve to be here in, until they can show that they can, in, they can act better. Well, we worked at that for a while, but it became very difficult, um, and I lacked a lot of power to bring any change um, in, in the midst of that system. So my wife and I had an opportunity to travel, and when we came back, um, I needed, a, I had a school year before I was going to start my doctoral work. So I took a job at a nonprofit organization very, very close to here um, doing gang prevention counseling. So it was my job to go into four public schools a week. And, um, and this, of course, was before the California economy had imploded and there was actually money available. And they were um, giving grants to these nonprofits to go in and do gang prevention. So it was my job, like I said, to go into these four schools and to meet with kids who either were in a gang, family member was in a gang, or had just been manifesting gang-like behavior. They had um, been caught tagging their school, or they had threatened their teacher with a pencil, or had done something that was at risk. So I would go into these schools, and often it was either the principal or the guidance counselor who would give me the folder to one of these kids. And it would often come with something like, well, here's... Um, Here's Jacob, and uh, Jacob just came to us. He was in an orphanage for a while because he watched his father beat his mother with a wrench on their front lawn. Um, or, you know, here's Sally, and um, Sally's dad just got out of jail, and from as far as we know, um, he comes back every other week to do his laundry um, and to, to beat them up. So these just horrific stories of loss and pain. Um, and that was just what the school counselor could tell me. So I would meet with this student, and we'd sit in some little dusty back corner of a public school, um, some little book storage area where the school could find a place to put a table and two chairs. Um, and I realized really quickly as they would tell me these stories that there was absolutely nothing I could do. I mean, the, the story that the school counselor or principal would tell me that was horrific in and of itself was just the tip of the iceberg. And after, after a while, they would tell me these stories, and they were just heart-wrenching. And I knew that there was really nothing I could do. I mean, there were certain actions I could take make people aware of certain things, but I couldn't change the fact that this was the family they grew up in, um, that this was a situation that had happened to them. So I realized really quickly that all I could do was for one hour once a week when I would meet with them was to share in their hell with them. And so I did that, and I did that from reading the works of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and reading some of the Trinitarian elements of Karl Barth um, and even some of the early Jurgen Moltmann um, and decided that what I would do is for one hour once a week would share in their hell with them. And an interesting thing happened. I would haul in this bag of Connect Four and checkers and um, these board games, and I would just set them on the table. And of course, the kids loved it because they would get to leave class to play checkers with me or play some board game with me. But we started to share, share our stories together, and they would share their story with me, um, and I'd share mine with them. And for one hour, once a week, we'd actually share deeply in each other's life. And there was transformation that actually happened in them. Um, there wasn't this radical transformation that they didn't have all these issues that, um, had been, th that had been kind of nipping at their heels for their whole life. That didn't go away. But there was this real way that something very powerful happened um, where we would share in each other's lives that, that God was really present in the midst of that. And they were, I was allowed to speak deeply into their lives. Um, but instead of saying things like, well, you can't do that because... God wouldn't like that or because that would make you a bad boy or a bad girl. I could start speaking into their lives um, in a much more powerful way. I could say, well, you know, you can't do that um, because that'll hurt you. And if that hurts you, it'll hurt me because I'm your friend. And you can't do that because I'm your friend. Or when I see, you, when I see that attitude that you have, um, I wonder about that, not because I want you to be better, but because I want to be in relationship with you. Um, and that could be problematic to multiple relationships that you have. The light bulb that went on for me is that there's something in the midst of actually just sharing in each other, suffering and joy, that there's a really a concrete way that God is present in the midst of that, that I've tried to theologically develop um, through these two books. And you really never had any, any other opportunity to be with those kids or any other kind of, let's say, influence uh, in their lives other than these one-hour meetings. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe I would see them once in a while in the hallways, but for the most part, it was that one hour once a week. Um, and I was constrained by the school and I was constrained by the job that, that I, I worked in. And, um, but there was something that really powerfully happened when we were able to share um, our suffering with each other. And I tried to make that mutual. Um, I would try, um, to keeping a boundary that I think is important that hopefully we can talk about as we go in these, but um, I also shared my own story with them. And there was something very powerful 
for them to, to hear my story and to participate um, in my own story. Did you have any way of knowing what kind of impact your, your uh, time together was having on them? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, and there's kind of two kind of rationalities that I think can operate in that. In the rationality of influence, there was no way I could know. Yeah. And in many ways, I was a failure because these kids went back to their same situation. I'm sure some of them are, are in jail now. Um, the kids we worked with um, in the congregation, we don't know what happened to many of them. A lot of them were in eighth grade and they went to ninth grade and got jumped into gangs themselves. Um, so from the rationality influence, it was a failure. Um, we, didn't, we, don't have any, um, we don't have any trophies to show for it. Yeah. But in the rationality of actual play sharing, of trying to do relational ministry as being with and being for, as God is with and for us. I don't know if it was successful, but I really believe it was faithful and that we were faithful to their humanity. And in this, in, in being a gang prevention counselor, I felt like I was faithful to their humanity. Um, and so was there radical change in their lives? I don't know, and I don't know if I can see that. But I really do trust that something powerful happened in that one hour a week that they knew that they were not alone. If in the dark universe that they existed in, at least there was someone for one hour once a week who was with them. And I think in a real way that reflects the fullness of the gospel and the fullness of a God who becomes incarnate um, to share our place um, in its full brokenness, in its full darkness, um, to, sh to share with us so deeply that we're never alone again. Um, though we still live in darkness often, that we're never alone. So I don't know if it was successful, but I know that it was faithful. Um, and I think in the youth ministry particularly, we fall into this trap of, of looking at success too often. And I think it's a vocational hazard because you have young people who are you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, and they're making these jumps in kind of our societal structures to go to college or to decide for careers or to fall in love and get married. And so there, there does seem to be this trajectory of progress that's going on. But I think too often youth ministry has fallen into the trap that believes that then our job is to make kids successful or help kids be successful. And then we judge our own ministries by how many trophies we have. And I just don't know if that's a true reflection um, of God's own ministry in the world as incarnate, crucified, and resurrected in the person of Jesus Christ. And I think that we would do better to think of ourselves and think of our relationships as how can we be faithful both to the young person before us as well as to this God who has revealed God's self um, in Jesus Christ. Um, how can we be faithful to that as opposed to how can we be successful? All of that is, uh, is so uh, compelling because th there's got to be a way to measure success mm in this mm -hmm. in order for us to know whether this project is worthwhile or we're accomplishing anything. And, and it's like the, the need to ask that question and to find an assessment tool of some kind is, is so uh, overpowering that, it, that we lose the gospel itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, because when it comes to our Christian lives, don't we do the same thing? We, we're looking for God to fix things. Just, we're looking for, for, we think answered prayer means getting me out of whatever situation is a problem for me, or I perceive as a problem. But really, isn't that how Christ meets us anyway, is just the sense of knowing we're not alone. Mm -hmm. Meeting us in our loneliness, in our void, in our darkness, and bringing light because we're operating with faith not with, which is evidence of things not seen according to, to Hebrews. We're looking for something, for a restoration that isn't going to take place in this lifetime. It's, it takes place only in the sense of, of place sharing, mm -hmm. Christ sharing our place, mm -hmm. not in the sense of our circumstances necessarily changing, mm -hmm. which can be in itself a source of frustration because we're expecting or looking for something different. And, and, and don't we look for that? Because oftentimes in our preaching and teaching, we build a sense of expecting that. Yeah. It carries over into youth ministry in the sense you're, you're describing so well of, we want to see kids be more moral. We mm -hmm. want them not to make the same 
mistakes we made mm -hmm. uh, or to pursue mm -hmm. things that are going to cause them trouble. The, the whole sense across Christian, mm -hmm. our Christian lives, of just being there, mm -hmm. like your wife told you, yeah. as opposed to trying to make everybody be good mm -hmm. and not make mistakes. It just seems like you've, you're, you're talking about something that's yeah. uh, a, a big right. iceberg that uh, right. needs exploring. I think one of the things that, you're, that um, your question and comment points to that's helpful for me is maybe to boil it down. The thing that we haven't dwelled in enough is this question, where is God? Where do we encounter God? Which is, I think, one of the central elements of a Trinitarian theology is that God encounters us and God reveals God's self. And as God reveals God's self in Jesus Christ, um, we're taken into this, this Trinitarian reality. So I'll tell you a story, um, which I think often is the trap that we fall into in ministry. My son um, is four, moving towards five, and he's a, he's a great little existential um, philosopher and theologian, um, probably because I've terribly warped him. Um, but one night I was putting him to bed. It's my job to put him to bed. And I, of course, it's right before I go and watch TV when I put him to bed. So I'm always trying to hustle him off to bed so I can go and relax in front of the TV. Um, but one night I was putting him to bed and he, he started to, he, he said he was scared. And he was scared that there was a nightmare in his closet. So I had told him, well, don't be you don't need to be afraid of this. There's no nightmare in your closet. And I said, well, Jesus is with you. You, know, you don't need to be scared because Jesus is with you. And he said, no, 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 uh, there's a nightmare in, in my closet. I'm, I'm, I'm scared of this. And I said, well, Owen, you don't have to be scared. There's no nightmare in your closet. And I opened the door and, of course, turned on the light. And he was satisfied that there was no nightmare in his closet. But as soon as I turned off the lights and shut the door again, he said, it's back. The nightmare is back in my closet. <laughs> and I said, well, you can pray to Jesus and it will be okay. Jesus, Jesus will be here with you and you don't have to be afraid. So um, we prayed for a little bit, and, and he said, but where is Jesus? And I said, well, Jesus is here. If you pray, Jesus, Jesus will be here. But I don't see Jesus. Where is Jesus? And I said, well, he's, he, he's here with you, but I'm scared. There's a nightmare in my closet, and where is Jesus? And, of course, now I'm starting to say, well, if you pray, Jesus will be here, and you don't have to be afraid, and Jesus, Jesus will keep you from bad things happening. And I'm starting to doubt myself as I'm saying this. But then in just earnest desire to... to to comprehend something, he says, but I don't see Jesus, and I'm scared. Where is Jesus? And then in just the profundity of a four-year-old, he says, Jesus is not here. Jesus is not here. And of course, I said some prayer and left, but the more that, I, that when I left, and I kind of satisfied him so he wasn't crying anymore, but that is really the question, where is Jesus? And often kids live with nightmares in their closet, and we all do. And too often we want to say, well, Jesus is here. And if you pray to Jesus, the nightmare will go away. But one of the theological elements that I'm trying to develop more and more is how do we answer this question, where is Jesus or where is God? And I think that there's something in this story um, of, this, in, of this, incar this God who becomes incarnate in Jesus Christ that reflects to us the full life of God as, as Trinitarian, that God becomes present next to darkness, next to brokenness, next to pain. And too often in youth ministry, we see shiny, happy kids as the sign that our ministries are going well. And they actually become um, the sign of authentic adolescent faith. Kids who things are going pretty well for. And I don't want to belittle those kids, but often what it does is it perpetuates this idea that to be a Christian means that you have it together. And it leads us away from this question, where is God? Where is this God of the cross found? Where is this God who cries out to his Father on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And hears nothing. Where is this God? Well, if our models of great adolescent faith are just the shiny, happy kids, then what about all those kids that know that question deep in their being? But the church never helps them articulate it. And, you know, Christian Smith has done this study, that, um, the National Study on Youth and Religion, that soul-searching um, came out of this book that's been quite famous about teenage um, religiosity and faith. And one of the overwhelming findings of that book was simply that kids don't know anything about their faith. They know very little about um, any of the theological components of their faith. They can barely articulate um, 
what it means to follow Jesus. And I wonder often if the reason that is is because it doesn't matter to those kids. Those, those kids often are the shiny, happy kids that things are going well for, and we point to them as the mm. models of good adolescent faith. But of course, they don't need to, as Anselm would say, um, really dig into faith-seeking understanding because things are unfolding okay for them. For yeah. now. For yeah. now, for now, exactly. Yeah. Which is the real disservice we do to them yeah. because they go to college, they yeah. go into young adulthood, and then things don't go right for them. Totally disillusioned. And, and they don't have, they don't have um, a theological lens to yeah. see their reality where God is present in it. So one of the theological elements I'm trying to work out for youth ministry and ministry for the church in general is how do we answer this question, where is God? Um, and I think there's a deeply Trinitarian element about that. But it's also this assertion that God encounters us in darkness, in brokenness, in yearning, because um, God is reflected to us in Jesus Christ on the cross. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.